Good morning. Welcome to Plenary 7, SIMCON 2018. At, uh, we have a very important topic now, non-invasive ventilation. And I'm going to invite Dr. Patipan Pillay, who is the chest physician at Luton and Dunstable University Hospital, and the clinical director. Over to you, Dr. Patipan Pillay. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Jai Singer, for your kind introduction, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as I know that uh, most of you are the um, general internal medicine uh, specialists, and also there are many trainees in this audience, and I thought it's better just to focus on my talk uh, on the areas where you need some uh, support. So I will be going through this uh, subheading, just focusing on um, what are the things, uh, as a generalist, uh, you need to do when you come across patient with uh, non-invasive ventilation, especially um, if you have a machine, what you are going to do, and if you are planning to purchase one, what you are going to do. So I will be focusing on that. Uh, when you look at non-invasive ventilation, that is the definition of non-invasive ventilation is the ventilation without endotracheal intubation. So most probably that is going to be a mass ventilation, the ventilation without uh, endotracheal intubation. When you have a patient with ventilatory failure, you, it's better to look at the underlying problem Normally, that there are forces opposing the inspiration exceed respiratory muscle effect. And that uh, leads to res ventilatory failure or respiratory failure. There are two forces which normally um, oppose the inspiration. One is the elastic work of the stretching of the lungs, the factors preventing the stretching of the lung. If you have a very heavy lung, either due to consolidation or due to congestion, it is going to cause problem. It is not going to expand. Or problem in the chest wall is going to cause the same problem as well. If you have a large patient, obese patient, it is going to be a problem. Abdominal distension going to cause a lot of problem in stretching the lungs, so the inspiration is going to be affected. And the second problem is uh, if the airway is obstructed or narrowed, so these are the two causes, the forces which is going to oppose the inspiration and going to cause problem. We call that is a load on the respiratory muscle pump. So if you have a patient with respiratory failure, either the load is increased due to what I said before, or due to the poor pump capacity. The poor cap pump capacity can be due to either muscle weakness, neuromuscular problem, neurological problem causing the muscle to behave in a suboptimal way. It may be due to malnutrition and wasting of the muscles. It could be due to infection, sepsis, hypoxemia, or hypercapnia causing um, a reduced uh, muscle ca pump capacity. And the third cause you better to look at is, is there any problem with the respiratory drive? whether the patient is on any sedation, benzodiazepine or morphine-like substance, or whether there is any intracranial pathology. So if you have a patient with respiratory failure, it is better to think about those two, uh, three causes. So you have a patient with respiratory failure, you need to treat that, then you need to have a ventilator. The function of the ventilator is to augment the function of the inspiratory muscle and unload the respiratory muscle. That is the function. Whether it's an invasive ventilation or non-invasive ventilation, that is the function. So if you move on to the non-invasive ventilation, it's a mass ventilation, the ventilation without any endotracheal intubation. The question when we started using 20 or 25 years ago, there were many questions. Will it work? Will it work on the ward? Is there any side effect, whether we are going to kill the patient? Lot of questions. So it's better to just look at the evidence. 
So it's better to look at the literature. When you look at the literature, the literature is going back in ancient time. The evidence is telling you that it started long time ago, according to Bible. But the randomized control trial, uh, the first randomized control trial was in 1994-95. And this is the trial by Brochart and others, published in New England Journal of Medicine in 1995 clearly indicated that the intubation rate is reduced in patients with the non-invasive ventilation, complication rates were fewer, hospital stay is shorter, and the mortality rate also lower. Only thing we need to look at is the trial was conducted in an ITU, intensive care unit environment. So the non-invasive ventilation worked in intensive care unit and clearly it was demonstrated. So the question at that time is, will it work on the normal ward? This is the landmark trial answered that question. It's a Johnny trial, it's a Yorkshire, Yorkshire non-invasive ventilation trial. The early use of non-invasive ventilation for acute exacerbation of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease on general medical wards, a prospective multi-center randomized control trial done by Paul Plant and team in um, Leeds. There were 14 UK hospitals um, got involved over the 22 months comparing the NIV with standard therapy. The patient had mild to moderate acidosis and as I said, the patient were treated with an NIV on the normal ward. There were 236 patients. Half of them had conventional treatment, and half had conventional, the medical treatment with NIV. What the trial showed is the intubation, intubation rate was lower in NIV compared to control, and the mortality rate was also lower compared to the um, conventional treatment. So this trial at that time directly addressed the two biggest questions the respiratory and critical care community faced at that time. Is NIV feasible in the real world? And the answer was yes at that time after this. Can NIV be performed successfully outside the ICU? And the answer was strong yes. At the same time, there were other trials looking at the NIV, whether it works or not, whether there's any side effects, whether it improves the um, outcome. And this is by Giro and the team, um, just look at the infection rate. There's a 50-50 patient match case control study. NIV associated with lower risk of nosocomial infection, including pneumonia, UTI, and catheter-related infection compared to intubation and ventilation. Less amount of antibiotics use, shorter length of stay, and lower mortality. So it also showed it, does, it did work. Recently, there was a meta-analysis uh, published in two, 2016, 48 patients looking at uh, non-invasive ventilation in acute respiratory failure. And there is a Cochrane review published in 19, 2017 um, on non-invasive ventilation and uh, respiratory failure. Both of these studies reveal that there is lower intubation rate with the NIV. There's a lower risk of uh, in ICU and what associated mortality and lower length of stay both in ITU and on the wards and also the cumulative length of stay in the hospital. So there were huge benefits with NIV. There are also other benefits. Because of the nature of the non-invasive nature of the um, ventilation and the fact the patients are conscious, the application is easy. It's easy to start the NIV and whenever you want, you can stop that as well. It's improve the patient comfort. Patient is comfortable. They doesn't need to fight with the machine. 
it reduces the need for sedation and the sedation associated side effects were reduced. And the fact the patient is conscious, not intubated, the oral patency is there. Patient can talk, eat, and cough. So it's, it's so beneficial. Since there's no intubation, there is no early or late complication. So no local trauma aspiration, there, there's no injury to hypopharynx, larynx, or trachea, and also it reduces the intubation-associated infections. So overall, huge amount of benefit, and at the end, it reduced the course of treating that patient. So what are the indications of non-invasive ventilation? It does work, and large amount of benefit. So the indication, the main indication is in COPD with respiratory acidosis. Patient has acidotic pH, pH is less than 7.35. PCOT is more than 49 millimeter mercury, respiratory rate more than 23, and these patients should be on control oxygen and on maximum medical therapy. They are sick, but they are not too sick. If you are going to uh, start patient on too unwell patient, they may not uh, do well. There are other indications as well, obesity, hyperventilation, Neuromuscular disorder, we do have more and more patients living longer with this uh, problem and coming with respiratory failure. Patient waiting lung transplantation and post extubation. One of the indications, many patients after extubation, when they try to wean, uh, we support them with non-invasive ventilation. What about patient with asthma? There is a lack of high level evidence there is no large, well-designed, randomized controlled trial on asthma and non-invasive ventilation. Some support in observational studies and some case series, there are some um, suggestions. This is a Cochrane review of five trials looking at 206 patients. A uh, patient treated with non-invasive ventilation um, in ac acute exacerbation of asthma, and that concluded there's not enough data to support the use of NIV. This treatment remains controversial despite its continued use in current clinical practice. And larger prospective randomized controlled trials are needed to determ determine the role of non-invasive ventilation in patients with asthma. Still, we do come across patients are treated with uh, non-invasive ventilation, asthmatic patient. If you are going to do that, if your anesthetic colleague is going to do that, it's better to do that in an intensive care unit environment with close monitoring, with all the facilities are available to intubate and ventilate in case there is NIV failure without any delay. So think about that. There are contraindications. Patient may not um, tolerate if they are con unconscious, or confused, or agitated. If the upper airway, they can't protect the airway, it's difficult. If they do have more than one system failure, it is difficult to do the non-invasive ventilation. So if you have got hypotension or renal failure, things like that going on, it's better to go for intubation and ventilation. Consolidation on chest X-ray could be a contraindication or you should be careful and untreated, so you need to treat the pneumothorax with a chest tube before starting on non-invasive ventilation. And um, CV acidosis or life-threatening hypoxemia may be difficult as well. These are going to be a relative contraindication if you decide, decide at the start of the uh, non-invasive ventilation that you are not going to uh, escalate the patient for intubation and ventilation in the event of NIV failure. The ceiling of treatment, if you think it's going to be a non-invasive ventilation, then you may consider treating all those uh, um, uh, um, um, patients with uh, um, contraindication. But if you think that you are going to escalate, this patient is young, good quality of life, then it's better consider not to go through NIV, it's better to go for intub intubation and ventilation. For the next uh, few slides, I just want to say a few words about the ventilators. If you look at the ventilator, non-invasive ventilator, there are two types. One is a bi-level ventilator. There's a different pressure or volume in inspiration and expiration bi-level. 
And the second one, you may or may not call that as a ventilator, is a CPAP machine. Continuous positive airway pressure is a continuous pressure. So when you look at the bi-level ventilator, and uh, there are volume preset that the ventilator will give a fixed amount of volume to ventilate the patient. And the second one is a pressure preset. It will give a fixed amount of pressure to ventilate that patient. Nowadays, we don't use the volume preset ventilator. It is almost obsolete, or we don't normally use that. So we shall concentrate on the pressure preset ventilator. It's a BiPAP, bi-level positive airway pressure machine, combination of IPAP and EPAP. IPAP is an inspiratory positive airway pressure, and the EPAP is an expiratory positive airway pressure. Always the inspiratory pressure is higher than expiratory pressure. So when you look at this um, uh, curve that in a CPAP, if you are starting a patient on CPAP, the pressure is going to be constant both during inspiration and expiration. So around five centimeter water or six of three or four, so constant, so it doesn't change. That is a continuous positive airway pressure. When you go, give a bi-level ventilator during expiration, the pressure is lower, around five, almost similar to the CPAP pressure, and on expiration is around 15 or 20 of 10. So there is fluctuation because inspiration ventilate, expiration oxygenate, I will come to that term. So if you look at the respiratory effect of BiPAP, if you look at the inspiratory positive airway pressure, it does augment the alveolar ventilation, it increases the tidal volume by giving the pressure, it increases the tidal volume, which helps to reverse the acidosis and hypercapnia. It also reduces the work of breathing and respiratory effort, which in turn reduces the inspiratory muscle work, which in turn reduces the fatigability and the oxygen demand. Both of them will reduce the spontaneous respiratory rate of the patient. So IPAP normally ventilates the patient. When you look at the EPAP, it provides the P, peak ex, uh, expiratory, uh, end expiratory pressure. It also, because it is it's almost like a CPAP, so it increases the functional residual capacity. And also by giving that uh, EPAP, it recruits the alveoli. The alveoli opens up and kept opened so it opened up the alveoli, it recruit the alveoli, so alveolar capillary basement membrane surface area is going to be increased, so it helps the oxygenation. So EPAP oxygenate, IPAP ventilate. When you look at the CPAP, CPAP is almost like a continuous EPAP, so it is the same pressure during expiration and inspiration, but the low pressure. So the mechanism is same, so it is going to oxygenate. So help in the type one respiratory failure. It also slightly helps the ventilation as well, but the main thing is it will oxygenate. So it is useful in hypoxemic failure or type one failure or lung failure. So case of indication like cardiogenic pulmonary edema, pneumonia, ac acute lung injury, contusion, lung contusion, all those things might be treated with CPAP. I just want to touch up, up three slides on the mode of ventilation. You may have a machine waiting there in your emergency department or planning to buy one. So when you look at the BiPAP, the pressure support mode, the mode, there are three things I want to say that. One is a spontaneous mode or assist mode. That is the machine will uh, support the ventilation when the patient breathes. If the patient does not breathe, the machine does not do anything. So machine will augment the breath of the patient every time the patient breathes. So it's a spontaneous mode. Pressure support ventilation is a spontaneous mode. If the patient doesn't breathe or breathes in a 10 or nine or eight breaths per minute, it will also support only the eight breaths per minute. The second type is a spontaneous time mode. That is, it has got the spontaneous mode that it is going to support or augment the breathing of the patient 
every time the patient breathes, but it has also got a backup grade set by the operator. So if the breath breathing grade goes down below eight or 10, if the backup rate is 10 or eight, then the machine start to pump air. It start to over, overtake the patient breathing and control the breathing. So it's a spontaneous time mode, it's a ST mode, and it is safer. And this is the machine we normally use all over the country here and also in UK. It's a support from the ventilator is commonly used. And the last one is there's nothing there. The patient does not do anything. It's the time, it's a full control by the machine. It's a preset inspiratory pressure, it's a full support. All the breaths are machine triggered and there's no participation by the patient. There can be difficult, there can be difficulty in synchronizing sometimes. The patient might be fighting with the machine in that. So there's a three mode. It's one is a spontaneous, spontaneous time, and now is a time that is a full control by the machine, so remember that. So if you have a patient with a COPD waiting in the emergency department, you may have the machine, the ST machine. So normally what we do is you start the IPAP pressure around 10 centimeter water, EPAP four centimeter water, as I said, IPAP will ventilate, EPAP will oxygenate, and the inspiratory time, depending on the respiratory rate of the patient, and normally it's around one second or so. And the backup rate, probably you set around 10 breaths per minute, and the oxygen, how much oxygen you are going to give, depending on the target saturation, and it's better to go for 85 to 90% uh, saturation. That is enough. These patients have been living with hypoxemia for a long time. Don't try to correct that uh, too much. So start with a 10 IPAP and a 4 EPAP and increase the pressure gradually by two to three centimeter every five minutes to the maximum of 20 centimeter. And the reassess after one hour. Uh, the de decrease in the respiratory rate and improvement in the pH is a good predictor the patient is going to do well. The main thing is the respiratory rate. So that will tell you this patient is going to do well. So when you are monitoring the patient by looking at the patient, whether the patient is becoming more and more comfortable, whether the respiratory rate is coming down, the pulse rate is uh, coming down, and the chest wall movements are better, and the accessory muscles are not working now, it doesn't need, and the patient is coordinating with the machine, all are telling that uh, this patient is getting better. You need to continuously monitor this patient with the pulse oximetry. If there's no significant improvement after four to six hours, it is very unlikely this patient is going to get better, provided you have been um, um, changing the pressure and doing everything uh, correct, correctly then you need to decide. If you have already decided that I'm going to intubate and ventilate in NIV failure at the start of uh, the NIV treatment, then you are going to call your anesthetic, anesthetic colleague and ask him to come and intubate and ventilate. If this is a ceiling of treatment, then you may continue and go for palliative treatment. What about weaning? As these patients are conscious, when they are better, they auto wean, they take it out. They know they are very well. They themselves uh, wean, wean, it, wean it from the machine. Otherwise, look at the respiratory rate, heart rate, pulse, uh, blood pressure, uh, pH, and see whether you are going to do that. And especially, if you are going to stop the machine, first stop it during the daytime and continue during the nighttime in order to just uh, prevent that uh, REM sleep associated hyperventilation and nocturnal problem. And then after one or two days, then you may uh, completely uh, stop the machine. The main problem we do come across in non-invasive ventilation is the interface. Patient can't tolerate, there can be side effects. So you need to choose the best one. It should be comfortable, it should not leak, and should not cause any pressure ulcers. The main complication is the pressure ulcer. So you need to be careful. So ladies and gentlemen, that the success of the non-invasive ventilation depend on those three um, uh, factors. 
The main thing is the clinician skill. This is a conscious patient, lot of interaction between um, a clinician, patient, and the ventilator. You need to spend large amount of time sitting with the patient and talking to the patient and holding the mask to, for the patient to get used to that. So the skill of the clinician is much more important than the capacity of the ventilator. Remember that. The success is depending, going to be depend on you and your um, supporting workers, including the nurses. You need patient and time, and it is an art, the non-invasive ventilator. So just to conclude, non-invasive ventilation is the most important advance in respiratory medicine in the last three decades. And the trial of NIV should be considered early in the course of acute respiratory failure as a means of uh, avoiding intubation and reducing hospital stay and mortality. Patient selection is important. You need to choose the patient well, and they are sick, but they should not be too sick. And the physician with, a good, uh, with an interest and time in their timetable to look after these patients should be available. There should be a good and supporting nurses in a designated ward to look after this group of patients. And you should also have a good working relationship with an anesthetist. They should be informed that you are starting a patient on an NIV and they may need intubation, so it's better to inform them. And especially in Sri Lanka, I feel that all the acute hospitals, whether it's small or large, all should have a small dedicated team, maybe a few nurses, couple of nurses and a consultant interested in NIV, uh, should be there to provide this important service. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Pradipan uh, for this interesting lecture. I think it is a very well balanced academic aspects and uh, basics of the NIV was covered. Thank you, Dr. Pradipan. Uh, with the setup of new uh, emergency treatment units all over the country, mainly managed by the, our internal medicine physicians, I am sure you, would have, uh, you will have more questions to ask him. I think he is happy to answer. Uh, thank you very much for the comprehensive talk. Now, uh, we know that there are few inherent problems with NIV as well, but now, the high flow nasal oxygen had been in use in pediatric practice, which of, of course is coming to adult practice as well. So uh, what is your experience and advice for the uh, physicians uh, who actually now we have been using NIV for the last four or five years? So do, what is your advice on high flow nasal oxygen for hypoxemic respiratory failure? High flow nasal oxygen. Uh. I think, I mean, I, I really wanted to touch that, but uh, I, di I didn't have time to do that. Uh, the question always is, I mean, the anesthetist uh, may or may not uh, believe in that is, uh, am I going to remove the hypoxic drive in patient whom you are going to consider high flow oxygen or high concentration oxygen? That's the thing you are talking about, is that right? I see. If you are going to talk about uh, type one respiratory hypoxemic, yes, I mean you just go for the the I think nasal prong and the CPAP and the um, nasal high flow oxygen. Uh, you can go for that, and it does work. So try that first, and if that works, it's continue that. The, uh, it's almost the mechanism is same. Um, you go for that. If that doesn't work, then um, uh, I think, I mean, it's going to, either you are going to go for intubation um, uh, or just uh, seal the treatment. So I will, uh, but the question is whether that hypoxemic patient, has he got type 2 respiratory failure as well? That is a different patient. This is a pure type 1 respiratory failure, that the treatment is um, uh, oxygen with uh, uh, other measures. Uh, yeah. Derek? You wanted to say something? Yeah.
questions, uh, so we'll uh, conclude the plenary seven uh, for the symposium of uh, Society for Internal Medicine Society. Uh, may I call upon uh, Prof. Tilak Chailat to hand over the uh, certificate of appreciation. He's one of our founder leaders for initiation of uh, Internal Medicine Society. <laughs> 